Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Emory Community Gathering for Healing and Hope, responding to a year with COVID-19. The idea for this gathering arose in conversation between our Office of Spiritual and Religious Life, faculty, staff, assistance program, and counseling and psychological services to offer our community just a moment to reflect on all that has happened over the past year. Since this time about a year and six weeks ago, that we as an Emory community, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, shifted to mostly remote learning and working. Not all of us staff went to remote work, and in fact, many have been working incredibly hard to keep our beautiful campus home safe and functioning throughout this time. Certainly, our healthcare workers were not remote, but were engaged much more deeply in new and heroic ways. And not all of our faculty, researchers, and students were fully online either. Those who have remained on campus and those working so hard in new conditions off campus have needed to lead us in an entirely new way of doing university life that none of us had ever experienced here in our lifetimes. Words like unprecedented became commonplace. Meanwhile, we know that the pandemic itself has not been by far the only traumatic event of this past year. When a year ago, it became undeniably clear that the US has an endemic racist violence occurring across our country at outrageous frequency, perpetrated by vigilantes and by some law enforcement whose use of deadly force has, as we saw in the case of George Floyd, led to murder. This ignited a resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement worldwide and seismic reckonings with the countless aspects of society that issues of systemic oppression require radically changing. Monuments that had stood for decades were finally torn down as people have said enough to histories of white supremacy and racism that continue to disenfranchise and severely limit the health, education, employment, safety, freedom, and lives of people of color. Meanwhile, at the same time, our country has been deeply divided along political lines, and we witnessed elections that had some of the highest voter turnout in history. At the same time, some Americans, angry with the results, attacked our nation's capital in destructive and deadly insurrection. Even now, voting rights are in controversy around the US, and just last month, Asian women's and other lives were taken right here in our city of Atlanta and elsewhere. Over the year, we have also seen new inspiring leaders rise up, and we have lost important leaders of great influence who have promoted justice and love. It has been such a full year as we look back. We know that some of the most seismic changes have been on the deeply personal level, the ways that the events of this time have impacted our lives, our health, our families, our friends, our elders, our youth, our education, and our work. So many have suffered the death of loved ones or serious impairment with COVID-19. Despite the medical breakthroughs that we have had, we know that death and illness, anxiety, and uncertainty continue to shape human experience around our world. And yet we as an Emory community have stayed together and we have continued to move forward, sometimes in incredibly powerful and beautiful ways. And so we wanted to offer this time today to mark in some small way, all that we have experienced together to put some punctuation on the past year and to rededicate ourselves to our Emory community as we seek to bring it back. Different for sure, wiser and stronger, we hope, more just and more loving, more engaged in health and well being in the important ways that we wanna change and develop our society and world going forward. We're grateful to all the faculty and staff colleagues who will share reflections from both healthcare and our university life today to students who will offer their reflections, to our president who will offer closing words, and our music director, Maury Allums, who will help us heal with music. Friends, welcome to this time of gathering for healing and for hope. We hope this time and the other expressions that we know will follow in the coming year will help to support you to cultivate the caring, healing, and hopeful community that we desire for Emory to be. Mindful that the spirit of love and justice moves in and around us when we gather, and when we affirm those human values that we hold most deeply in common, we say welcome to this time. Peace be to you. Thank you, that was beautiful. And thank you for gathering us here today and uh, for uh, in including me. I'm happy to be with all of you. I so many times over the last year have been asked by folks, you know, what I'm, what I'm leaning on and what I'm looking to, what I'm reflecting on. 
and I think for me always consistently it's the written word and um, just wonderful poems and essays that I lean on and share. I know many of you on on this call probably have received an article from me. I really wanted to share with you uh, some reflections from an article that I've turned to repeatedly and over and over and shared so many times over the last year. And it is an article written by Professor Jasmine Ward, who teaches at Tulane University. She wrote it for Vanity Fair in September of 2020. And the title is On Witness and Respair, A Personal Tragedy Followed by Pandemic. The article is luminous. Um, Professor Ward is a gifted mm -hmm. writer. I please encourage you to read her books and her other writings. But the, um, the words follow her life and reflection. In September of 2020, Professor Ward lost her husband. It was in January 2020, she lost her husband. It was before the COVID pandemic set in. Um, he died of an upper respiratory tract infection. And in the, in the paragraphs that follow her revelate, that revelation in this article, she talks so much about the landscape of her life and what she experienced, not just individually, but in the community that she was in. And so much of what she writes is just so reflective of what I was going through. And I know so many people on this call were going through, including since she was a professor, having to start to teach and deliver some services online and also homeschooling her children. But she also spends so much time talking about the personal despair that she was in in the morning. And um, the, the clarity of her words were so important for me because it connected to what we were experiencing, not just at Emory, but across the world. She goes on to talk about the murder of George Floyd. And in, in those paragraphs, she talks so much about the hope that she got from seeing millions of people across the world really come out and speak to accountability, but calling us to higher levels of accountability as, a, as, a, as human beings. She leans on very key themes in this article that have become important to me. One is this idea of respair, which is in the title itself. And respair is really the opposite of despair. Respair is a return to hope. And she talks extensively in this article about witnessing, uh, how we have to witness not just what's going on in our lives, but what is happening in the lives of people around us and why it's so important that we witness not, um, not just our own experiences, but the experiences of people around us to validate the collective experiences that we're having. She talks about witnessing not just um, not just a, as a theoretical concept, but being present. So in, in the here and now and using all of our senses to really witness to what's happening around us. I wanna just read you, I, I'm gonna close by reading the final paragraph of this essay where she brings all of those concepts together, this idea of witnessing and using all of our senses to witness. Um, and how witnessing is a, an act of here and now, but also a fully engaging who, every part of our humanity. When my beloved died, a doctor told me, the last sense to go is hearing. When someone is dying, the law, they lose sight and smell and taste and touch. They even forget who they are. But in the end, they hear you. I hear you. I hear you. You say, I love you, we love you, we ain't going nowhere. I hear you say, we hear. And in that last line, she uses not just the um, hear as in a, a sensory effect, but hear as in time and place. Again, witness, but also um, a full commitment to witnessing using every part of our being. And I think that has been so important for me 
in, in the last year. And I know it's been so important for so many parts of our community. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am really grateful for this gathering for me and from a human resources perspective to offer thanks and gratitude to all of our employees who have been continuing to support this university uh, during this year. It's been hard um, for a lot of employees in a lot of different ways, uh, but we are grateful for continuing to keep the operations uh, moving here at Emory and supporting the mission uh, that we love so dear. I would also like to acknowledge, I mean, we, even though a lot of our employees were working remotely and, and I would like to acknowledge and thank them for pivoting so quickly to be able to move off campus and continuing to support our university, uh, which was unprecedented. I mean, we often wondered if we could all work remote and we proved that we could be all successful working remotely. But I also would like to really take this opportunity to acknowledge some of the groups who were on campus and have been on campus all during this, this time, keeping the operations running. Um, a couple of groups that I would just like to acknowledge, I mean, campus, when you think about campus services, all of our facilities management, um, employees taking care of our buildings, uh, making sure the grounds are beautiful. I mean, we can see that the grounds at, at Emory continue to be beautiful all during this time making sure all of our systems are running um, effectively um, in all of our buildings. Our environmental health and safety group, um, supporting the researchers and all the work that they do. Um, of course, residents life and all of the employees in campus life. I mean, all of the individuals um, committed to making sure uh, that we're supporting all of our students uh, during this time. Our IT staff, um, student health and services, um, Yerkes, I mean, when you think about Yerkes and animal resources, I mean, all of the research continued during this time and it was important for all of our employees um, and Yerkes and, and School of Medicine to continue to support um, the, the mission and the research for the university. Our counseling resources, um, uh, CAPS and the Oxford Counseling Center, FSAP supporting our employees and also psychiatry um, as far as helping our employees and students um, to make sure that we're focusing on the emo emotional well-being of all of our employees. Um, our police department, um, they have been on campus all, all during this time. Some others, uh, dining services. I mean, we a lot of our dining services, I mean, that was open during this time and, and they were committed to supporting our students and individuals who are on campus. campus. Um, environmental services and also public safety. So as you can see, there were a lot of employees on campus during this time um, supporting and continuing to support the university. And we would just like to thank all our employees for the work they've done uh, during this past year. Um, I would encourage everyone to continue to be safe. And I know I personally look forward um, when we are all back on campus and when we return to campus in the fall, um, back as a vibrant um, university that we know and love so well. So thank you so much for the time. I'm going to read some words I wrote for this occasion. Sometimes they address a you and you might find that your own experience corresponds with that you or you may find that it seems to be addressing someone else and there is room for wherever you need to be in relation to it. Song for waiting. Song for patience and its reverse. Song for the seeds you planted and watched bloom into zinnias and how somehow this is a whole different spring. Song for the cleaners and custodians. Song for hands washed till they crack. Song for you who returned to a home that was not one. Song for the safety you built from scraps, a teaspoon of sugar. 
song for the child who went into isolation with one voice and came out with another. Song for every time that voice broke. Song for the child with voice broken by the police. Song worn through with its singing. Song for Mariam Kaba who said hope is a discipline. Song for the prisoners made to dig graves. Song for the breath of the dying and the quiet that comes after. Song for the air you breathe in the car when at last you can take off your mask. Song for the lines it has written on your face. Song for the warehouse workers. Song for the pile of clothes the doctor steps out of when she gets home. Song for those who died at the beginning and did not know. Song for John Berger, who asked, what is the relation of the dead to what has not yet happened, to the future? And who answered, all the future is the construction in which their imagination is engaged. Song for the future. Song for the night shift. Song for imagination beyond reason. Song for the space that opens when stone carved into threat falls to the river. Song sung by the workers in the salon, sometimes together, sometimes alone. Song for the baby who comes to the Zoom class and how that is also learning. For the lawyer who says he's not a cat. Song for the pixels into which you cast your body again and again until you lost all resolution. Song for the sky beneath which you piece yourself back together. Song for tea, song for honey, song for the arm and the children's band-aid, song for the wakeful nights you heard your beloved speak through sleep, song for the glove a nurse fills with warm water and places over the hand of the man dying untouched by his kin, song for its weight added to the year's inventory somewhere between dust and deliverance. Song for working, song for waiting, song for what grows in the soft brown dark. Good afternoon. I am Paula Gomes. I am the executive director of the Faculty Staff Assistance Program, as well as Assistant Vice President of Human Resources. And I just wanted to share that given this year, given recent weeks, if you are having difficulties or find that you are struggling, now, in the coming days, weeks, or months, you are not alone. The FSAP is here to support you and your family members with emotional well-being services and resources. You can reach out for more information by calling us at 404-727-WELL, reaching out to our website at fsap.emory.edu. We will now have faculty and staff reflections of healing and hope. I am indebted to the host to allow me to express my appreciation to my fe fellow healthcare workers as we have passed through the last year of this pandemic. In trying to convey my thoughts on this topic of healing and hope, I thought about J.R.R. Tolkien's quote from the Fellowship of the Ring, that for him the grief was still too near, a matter for tears and not yet for song. I hope that my words can demonstrate that we have seen and have felt the tenuous beginnings of a resonant chorus but are yet deeply yearning for a happier refrain. As healthcare workers, we knew our purpose, it had not changed. We were to continue to relieve suffering with new challenges. We had no idea how much we were to be with suffering and we had no idea how much we would change with suffering. The suffering was not limited to hospital rooms, waiting rooms, makeshift tents or ambulances. 
Not one individual was untouched by the abrupt change of life as we knew it. We healthcare workers were lauded as brave and heroic and the kindness of strangers was abundant and determined. We were lucky. We continued to go to our places of work. We connected deeply with our coworkers who were there as we were there. Darkly, we saw the specter move in and strike coworkers, friends and family, a clinical menace to which we had limited defense. But then the work of new therapeutics, new teams, all united in single-mindedness, this thread of hope that we could support and even treat and cure. The patients continued to arrive in desperation and tragedy. The reality of the constancy of this threat plagued our thoughts. Confusion, conspiracy, injustice, response. Our work of caretaking and leading, of pouring out, of sacrifice seemed to, to contribute, but where was this all going? Where are we all going? Doubt creeps in. What is heroic and do I wanna be a hero? When will my own suffering be relieved? When can we change to love better, be better? How can we persist when there is disbelief? What I can say to you today is we are here, it is now. There is one step and it is in front of you, in front of me. There is thankfulness of what we have and can give. The best I can do is love and give around me. C.S. Lewis wrote, I thought I could describe a state, make a map of sorrow. Sorrow, however, turns out to be a, not a state, but a process. Let us embrace this process together that I may protect you and you will protect me. I'm an American born and bred, and after living in Africa for nearly 20 years, returned home to America because of COVID. What a time to come home. I've been amazed by the divisiveness, the mistrust, and the hate. Maybe it's because I've lived among Africans for so long, or maybe it's because I'm new to this part of the country, I don't know. But I see the blatant racism against Black people around me, and it strains my mind and crushes my heart. I see it in the segregation, the condescending attitudes, and the indifference. Do we as Americans really not care about people because of the color of their skin? George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Breonna Taylor, we say their names. Is this my country where a nameless black person can be killed without compunction? Wait, my country? But some of my fellow Americans are telling me to go back to my country. I'm confused. Ah, but how can I forget my eyes? My Asian eyes above the mask elicits hate. I haven't returned to America to escape COVID. Here I'm being blamed for bringing the Kung flu virus itself. Young A. Wei, Hyun Jung Grant, Sun Cha Kim, Xiao Jie Tan, Sun Jung Park, Dao Yo Feng. Asian women killed here in Atlanta around the corner from us. My son and I joined the march downtown at a rally to honor their lives and to say, stop Asian violence, as if we have to say this. I see my son walking on the road with other protesters and pull him up to join me on the sidewalk. I'm afraid that someone might try to run him over. But the fear passes. This is our home and our country and we will heal it. We have the strength. At Emory and throughout America, Asian Americans have led and implemented the studies that have produced the COVID vaccines that have saved countless lives and will save many, many more. We are the doctors, the nurses, healthcare workers who have treated our COVID patients with compassion despite the fatigue and in spite of the hate. And however briefly justice is served, Derek Chauvin is convicted in the death of George Floyd at his hands under his knees. After Chauvin's conviction, Ahmed Arbery's dad said, I really had my doubts. I'm being honest with you because of how they were doing African-American people for so long, but I'm feeling real comfortable right now because it looks like he'll get some justice because of the way the handle, it was handled professionally. If Ahmed's father has hoped that there will be justice, then why can't we? We are so glad you could join us. It is outstanding how we've managed to get through these extraordinary times when life has felt like a series of platters on sticks spinning in the air all at the same time. We have families with children, parents, dear friends, and beloved pets, all depending on us to see life through lovingly. Our work responsibilities have been reshaped through this past year, and our ability to be flexible has been admirable. We have coped with life-changing loss on many levels. There has been an awakening to long-time injustices. 
a reckoning of how we can and must move forward with establishing historical acknowledgement, seeking true equity, practicing intentional inclusion, and in celebration of diversity. Now things are preparing to change again, though it cannot be like a light switch. The summer months give us all time to map a reset, three months to breathe deeply, to gather our thoughts and make plans for what will be a new life work balance. We need this time to establish a new rhythm to go forward with. I'm optimistic and hopeful that we will continue to be flexible, compassionate, and a shining example of success that says we can do this for ourselves, for each other, and for Emory. Please know your employee council is here to help and give your concerns a voice. Our website includes multiple ways to reach us and many resources at employeecouncil.emory.edu. We can do this. Let's reset together as one Emory. Thank you. Hi there. Our Emory students are amazing. They are bright, caring, compassionate, and definitely invested in making a difference in this world. Um, but this year has truly tested them, but also revealed their courage, resilience, and grit. I am happy to welcome two of these amazing students now, Hannah and Astria, who will share their messages of healing and hope with you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Hannah and it is truly such a privilege to be here with you all today. Um, today is actually my birthday and I couldn't think of a better birthday gift than to be able to be among such great panelists as well as just to connect with all of you watching today. Um, and as it's chosen my slide, I founded the Letters to Dad Foundation in August of 2020 and it has since launched in March of 2021. Or 2021. <laughs> and the Letters to Dad Foundation is a student-led university-wide nonprofit created to cultivate healthy and comforting spaces for grieving college students and faculty through support, understanding, and community. Um, and this often takes shape in the form of in-person and online bereavement group sessions for students and faculty, as well as through podcast episodes, blog and Instagram posts, and more. Um, and I actually founded this project based on my very own experiences with grief. So during my senior year of high school, my dad unexpectedly passed away. And when I transitioned into college, I was having a very tough time. And because I felt mainly really alone in my circumstances, which I'm sure is a, a feeling that is incredibly familiar to everyone in some capacity, given the recent events of this year. And initially it was really difficult for me to meet others on campus who I could relate to. But once I really was willing to become vulnerable, I was able to meet more people on campus who had gone through similar things um, in comparison to what I had gone through. And through this community, I was truly able to start healing in a way that I hadn't before. And this whole experience showed me just how important it is it is for us to have community when we are grieving, whether we are isolated or not, because whether we are grieving the loss of a parent, a relationship, a pet, or an experience we expected to have, we still need community. So therefore, I created the Letters to Dad Foundation so that students and faculty and staff, anyone like me or beyond, could have community and not have a difficult time finding it because community truly brings healing and strength. So whatever grief you are experiencing, know that you never truly walk alone, even at your darkest point, because the whole Emory community and Letters to Dad is here for you. Thank you. Hello, and good afternoon to everyone. I am Astria Wilson. And I now invite you to share with me as I express the words that ring the loudest in our community. Despondent, rejected, isolated, invisible, attacked, 
dejected, angry, outcast, hurt, broken, frustrated, unresolved, overwhelmed, scared, misunderstood, outraged, abandoned, tired, despair, desperate for change, silence. We have endured the silence of waiting for the world to stop responding in hate. Silence in our homes because we are not able to have visitors. Silence from an institution that does not properly acknowledge the lynchings of the many black persons who are gunned down at the hands of law enforcement, we have endured the silence of a shutdown campus from the empty halls and closed libraries due to COVID-19 gathering restrictions. We have endured the silence of face-to-face -face contact and every transaction has become a contactless event. We have silenced and suppressed our emotions from a promised but yet invisible fight against white supremacy and racism in America. When we become silent against injustice, it begins to echo as the loudest sound in our community. But we hope for a better world that would understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not the creation of another position or another seminar. We hope for a world that we will, will stop processing inclusion as whiteness, giving others the permission to be themselves, but we'll come to understand inclusion comes when we can all show up as ourselves and be ourselves unapologetically. In the words of my dear sister and friend, Sharon Saffold Harris, if we have a problem with a person and an issue with them being them, the issue is not the person. But the issue is us, because we all have permission to be ourselves. We all, we all come possessing the ability and permission to be ourselves. And as a community gathered together for healing, we come all believing that we would work as one unit to uplift each other. We will create an Emory where it is home to all of the students that who matriculate through this institution. So now I ignite a candle. And the igniting of this candle is as a symbol of burning up the old system and the old ways of doing business that would make us not feel like one community. In this flame, it captures patriarchal systems of oppression, histories that perpetuated separation and failed to distribute liberties. But this flame also comes with a refining and a purification to clear a path for a holistic future. From this place, we move forward as a one unit fighting issues of race, discrimination, sexism, elitism, white supremacy, and all manners of hatred towards choice. May the issues of the Asian community no longer be an Asian issue. May the issues of the LGBTQIA plus persons no longer be an issue of their community. May the issues of the black person no longer be a black issue, but we would unify as one Emory and all issues are our issues. So now I ask that as a community and as one Emory, we use our voice to leverage power, to influence systems for change. Let us not fall back into our comfortable place of doing things. Let comfort not come until we can all say that we are comfortable. And the new flame that refines and purifies, may it never burn out at Emory. These are my reflections. Assalamu alaikum, and upon you be peace. As we begin today, I wanted to invite everyone to join me in a few moments of silence, to center ourselves, to reflect, to meditate, or pray in your own way as we think about a whole year with COVID-19. This pandemic, the challenges of life and school, 
the loss of family and friends and colleagues, illness, isolation, the toll on mental health and the sacrifice of our healthcare heroes. Alongside it, let us contemplate the twin pandemic of systemic racism and the hurt and the pain and the activism. Let us remember all who have suffered at the hands of racial injustice and inequality. And remember that we stand on the shoulders of all the people who were forcibly brought over the oceans and enslaved, terrorized and tortured for hundreds of years. Let us also remember to consciously acknowledge the native peoples on whose land our communities are built on. I now invite you to join me in lighting a candle safely. And once we have done that, feel free to join me in a supplication if you would like to. So I'm lighting my candle now. creator and instigator. We come before you inspired by the mind and creative heart of those whose efforts shape the way we attune ourselves to one another in compassion, care, and earnest longing for justice. God of health, justice, mercy, and humility. We meet this afternoon with hearts of gratitude for those who have created a common ground for the sake of the other in this time of twin pandemics. May we be reservoirs of deep commitment to nurture vitality and good health. May we be rivers of active justice alongside the heartbeats that drum for freedom from systemic racism. May we be oceans of courage to stand in the path of the stranger, the sojourner, the weak, offering courage and support from the depths of our souls. And let us be mindful of the deep wells of those who have gone on and left us as we continue inspired here at Emory and in the global community. In our shared humanity, let us promise to nurture our minds, cultivate our spirits, and work towards justice and healing. In all things, we ask your peace to flow freely in us all and make our beings attuned to the agencies and powers of good in this world and beyond. Amen.
I want to thank everyone who participated in today's gathering for coming together to reflect on a year unlike any other in modern memory. There are a few words that capture all of the emotions that people have experienced. This has been a period of great loss and suffering, of strife and injustice, but also a time of positive change. And through both words and actions, individuals were able to lead progress and find opportunities to improve our society in extraordinary ways. The path to this point has been difficult, yet I am optimistic about our future, and that is largely because of you. Throughout my first year at Emory, I have been inspired by the energy and the heart that radiates from this community. Students, faculty, and staff, everyone at Emory cares. And what's more is you use your time both in and out of the classroom and the workplace to serve others. The Emory mission is to create, preserve, teach, and apply knowledge in the service of humanity. Those are powerful words, but without you and your actions, they're just that, words. You give them life, you give them meaning. And throughout this year, you have showed our city, state, nation, and the world the kind of impact this university can have and, that the, val and the values that sustain all that we do. I couldn't be prouder of everyone at Emory, and I hope you've had a chance today to reflect, to meditate, and also to appreciate how incredible this community is. You're part of something very special here at Emory, and I hope whether you're graduating in just a few weeks or returning in the fall, you continue to be committed and connected. We're a community here, and there's so much more we can achieve together. Again, thank you all for attending this important gathering today. sing with me. 